Hi, I'm Ian Linklip, the Consumer Insider. For 25 years, I've been representing consumers against car dealers, debt collectors, and credit reporting agencies. Each week, I bring you the inside scoop on how it is that businesses use documents in the court system to bully and cheat consumers, and how you can fight back and resist against the system. Hi, I'm Ian Linklip, the Consumer Insider. For 25 years, I've been representing consumers in disputes with cardio... Ugh. Hi, I'm Ian Linklip, the Consumer Insider. For 25 years, I've been representing consumers in disputes with car dealers, credit bureaus, and debt collectors. Each week, I give you the inside scoop on how it is that these businesses use documents and unfair practices to cheat consumers. And... Each week, I'm going to bring you a little bit of information that will help you fight back and be heard by the businesses who want to take your money. So this week, I want to talk to you about the debts that you should never pay. Um, and when we talk about debts that you should never pay, um, I'm not saying that you can't pay them if you want to. You should absolutely pay them if you want to pay them. If you think that you have a moral obligation to pay the debt, absolutely, that's fine. But what I'm talking about today is debts that by paying them, you are going to change your legal relationship, your rights as it relates to the people who you're paying. And so you're going to take on an added burden and you're going to have a consequence down the line that you may not expect. So we're talking about debts that are going to create a legal problem for you if you pay them that you did not have before you paid that debt. So let's start by talking about the first one. First, never, ever, ever pay an identity theft debt. Uh, we see consumers all the time who come into our office having paid these debts, and it is a, it is a huge problem. Uh, let me give you an example of the most common places where we see consumers doing this. Uh, very regularly, we will see consumers walking into our office having been presented at the closing table for a mortgage with a debt that they've never seen before. And this usually happens because the, the mortgage companies are pulling credit reports and getting updated credit reports just before the closing to make sure that there isn't something about that consumer's financial picture that they did not know before. Now, remember, uh, creditors have the ability to pull credit reports and take a look at what you're up to financially uh, at pretty much any time. So uh, one of the things that happens is that credit reporting agencies have been generating what we call trigger lists. And these trigger lists will uh, actually send a credit report, push a credit report out to a debt collector or a creditor any time that you've done something like ask for a mortgage. And so what might happen is, for instance, that a consumer wants to get a mortgage, they go out and they apply for that mortgage. That mortgage application triggers a report to get sent out to a debt collector who was previously not trying to collect on the debt, but now sees that they have the opportunity to put some pressure on this consumer by dropping a new item on their credit report. And as soon as they do, that consumer is going to be in for a very big surprise when they head to the closing table to try and get their mortgage closed. So what happens is they wind up at the, at the mortgage brokers or the title agent, uh, title agent's office, and all of a sudden they are looking at a credit report, which was previously just fine, had a big, you know, nice score on it, like a 700, and all of a sudden it's down in the 600s because there's a brand new debt collection item that may be years and years old, but... A debt collector saw the opportunity to drop that on the report, and boom, credit's ruined. So this happens very often in the context of identity theft accounts, which can come on the reports you know, suddenly and definitely come without any warning to consumers. Now, the problem with paying these is that once you pay this, this debt, this identity theft debt, you are effectively conceding that you owe this debt. And so once you've paid the debt, that item is cemented onto your report, although it will go down as a paid debt. Uh, the prior history, the payment history, that, that those earlier status codes of showing uh, you know, 120 days, 180 days charged off and then paid later, uh, maybe even paid as a settled account because you thought you were getting a bargain. That's a terrible thing to have on the report. So ultimately, if you pay that debt, that identity theft debt, you are begging to be saddled with that item on your report for you know, the full duration of the seven years that they're allowed to report this. And we certainly understand that there's an, a huge amount of pressure uh, to get that mortgage put through. 
And if you want that mortgage badly enough, I understand that you're going to have pressure to do it. But just remember this, uh, that if it's a debt collector and they put it on your report and it's an identity theft, uh, an identity theft item, uh, most good attorneys can help you get that resolved pretty quickly uh, with either a declaratory action, an emergency injunction, things of that nature that can force a debt collector to stop paying and stop ruining your credit so you can get back to the closing table. So again, you know, if you feel the pressure that's there and you feel like your only chance of getting this house is to go through with it, by all means, go ahead. But remember that if you do pay it, you are, you are changing your relationship. You are taking on a burden that you did not have before, and you are giving yourself something else to do that you did not have to do before. So that's the first kind, it's an identity theft debt. The second thing is a debt that belongs to somebody else, uh, that, and paying that debt just to get it off your credit report. Um, and let me again give you the situation where we see this commonly rising. Uh, most frequently we see this in the, in the context of what we call a mixed or a mismerged credit file. And a mixed or a mismerged credit file happens when a credit reporting agency confuses you with somebody else, usually because there's a similarity of a name or other personal identifier. Uh, and the best example that we, we have is a Fred Jr. and a Fred Sr. These kinds of things happen all the time. So a father and a son uh, who shared a prior address, maybe even share a current address because one of them is uh, you know, a young adult, um, and they share uh, similar telephone numbers. Uh, they may have similar social security numbers because they, they live in the same geographic area. Uh, these are the kinds of things that create uh, points of correlation in a data file for a credit reporting agency. And you may see somebody else's, somebody else's debts showing up on your credit report. And ultimately, again, if you pay somebody else's debt, knowing full well that it is somebody else's debt, you are effectively acknowledging your liability for the debt, if not legally, certainly in, in principle. And this becomes a very difficult thing, especially if you have to go to court and convince a jury that you were not responsible for this debt in order to get it off the report, right? So if you actually have to file a lawsuit against a credit reporting agency because they had something on your report and you paid the debt just to get it off, now, of course, they're going to get to go to the jury and they're going to get to argue, hey, uh, this person, they paid the debt. They paid it knowing it wasn't theirs. And the reason that they paid it, it's probably because it's their debt. And we see credit reporting agency attorneys making these kinds of arguments all the time. They have, they have no qualms at all about lying to juries and saying that debts are yours because you've chosen to pay them. There may be other legal doctrines that may come to play uh, like the voluntary payment doctrine that may actually cause you to be uh, legally prevented from making the argument that it's not your debt. But most importantly, you are handing over to the credit reporting agencies the ability to argue that you paid it because it's yours. And so we tell people who are trying to get things off their report, maybe just because it's on there as a result of a mixed file, don't pay that debt. We'll dispute that debt. We'll sue the creditor if we have to to get a de declaration that you do not owe it. But most importantly, if you pay it, you may be living with it for an awfully long time. Uh, next, time-barred debts. Uh, time-barred debts are a very difficult uh, subject for a lot of reasons because we are talking about debts that people do, in fact, owe. But uh, what most people do not know about paying time-barred debts is that if you pay a time-barred debt in most states, and certainly in Michigan, uh, you are reviving a statute of limitations. Let me say it again. You're reviving a statute of limitations. And what that means is uh, a time-barred debt is a debt where the statute of limitations, the time period that the law allows within which a creditor or a debt collector can sue you for that debt, a time-barred debt is one where that time period has passed. And so in Michigan, there are several statutes that apply depending on what kind of a debt it is, uh, you know, two years for a cell phone, four years for a car, six years on a general contract. But if you are beyond the applicable statute of limitations, that creditor or debt collector cannot sue you. However, if you affirmably go out and pay them that debt, you are now opening the door to the courthouse for them when it had been previously closed. And you're saying, hey, come on, sue me. So if you wind up actually trying to settle a debt or make a payment plan on a debt that for which the statute of limitations has already passed, 
you are now wiping that away and they can come back in and they can sue you for the whole amount. So it's always important that you know you not pay, there's not a lot of good reasons to pay a time bar debt. And in many instances, these time bar debts shouldn't appear on your credit report anyways. So if it's not on your report and they can't sue you, paying the debt does nothing but create an exposure for you for litigation. So uh, we rarely would recommend that somebody pays a time bar debt you know, knowing full well that they can be sued later. And by the way, you know, it's very difficult to know what the full amount that they may want to get from you. So even though you may have a debt that started out only being several hundred dollars, if it's time barred, it may be, you know, according to the, the interest and in, uh, fees that they've got, that could be several thousand dollars, several times the amount of the original debt. And by reopening that statute of limitations, you can be creating a very large liability for yourself. So certainly you would not want to pay that time bar debt before you actually had some idea of how much is at issue and knowing full well that whatever payment you make is the end of it. And lastly, uh, paying a debt that you do not think you owe and you want to dispute later just to get it off your report. And again, this is this is falls into the general heading of what we call the voluntary payment doctrine. And this doctrine exists in federal law and it exists in a number of states. Um, and the doctrine says this, if you have, you're confronted with a bill that somebody is trying to collect for you and you pay this, pay this bill knowing full well that you do not owe it, you are effectively barred from arguing later that you did not owe this. Um, there's a lot of ways to, that this gets reformulated, but the gist of it is if you acknowledge this debt by paying it, you are not going to come back and challenge it at a later time. And if that's true, ultimately you're going to have a dickens of a time disputing it later or not paying it or coming back and seeking a declaratory judgment that you don't owe it. And most importantly, again, for our clients, uh, you're going to have a very, very difficult time trying to challenge this for purposes of your credit reports. So we, we generally do not allow people to pay uh, uh, debts that they think that they do not owe if they think that they're being overcharged for something, uh, if the debt's been fully satisfied. You don't want to pay that debt and take the risk that this is going to be on your report for a long time. So that's it. Those are the four kinds of debts that you should not pay. Um, Remember that you can go to my website, and on my website, I have posted a number of resources for people uh, looking to help uh, with their credit reports. We have a credit report security freeze, and remember that's new this year. You can seek to freeze your credit report uh, and only allow access to, uh, to your existing creditors. Um, that will help prevent identity theft. We have opt-outs from the pre-screened list, which means that you can stop the junk mail that's coming to your house. Uh, we also have letters there to... Uh, put you on the do not call registry, um, instructions on how to order up your credit reports, background checks, and checking uh, check writing reports. Um, just remember this, if you don't exercise your rights, they die. Uh, you always want to dispute false information on your credit report, dispute debts that people are trying to collect from you that you do not owe, register for that do not call registry, opt out of pre-screen re reports. If this video has helped you, pay it forward, help somebody else. Forward the, forward the video, hit the like button below, and leave us a comment or a review. Um, you can find me at www.consumerlawyers.com. Uh, we are on Twitter at MI Consumer Law, on Facebook at Michigan Consumer Law Center. And if you have a question or a comment for me, you can send it to podcast at consumerlawyers.com. And if you have a question you want me to deal with on the, on the, the, the video podcast, I'm happy to deal with it. Just send it to that address. Uh, you can find me, Ian Linklip, at www.consumerlawyers.com. That's it for today. Thanks for watching.